Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today in the U.S., we enjoy a higher quality of life than most of the rest of the world. We experience a quality of life that is virtually unparalleled in all of human history. And yet, there's this nagging undercurrent that I continue to be aware of in myself and around us in our culture. It's kind of like, I can't get no satisfaction. Now you'll be singing that song. I'm not going to sing any more of it. Um, but, but isn't it true? I mean, why? Why are we unable to experience satisfaction with the life that we have? And where can we go to find such satisfaction and contentment? The next four weeks is really an invitation to you and to people you may know to engage this ancient poem that is amazingly timeless and relevant for our day and age and the things that we experience today. And in so doing, we get to meet God, our rescuer. And what happens is our heart just sort of changes from the inside out. And this contentment gets planted right in the center of things. This year, we've been journeying uh, through something we're calling Rejoice With Me. It's really a large-scale retelling of all of the details and intricacy and the interwoven stories of things like the prodigal son and the story of Jacob and Esau, this other man who had two sons, and the story of you and me in our lives today. And in this series, we get to rejoice that we have a rescuer. And in the joy of knowing our rescuer, we get to kind of experience this change toward contentment and living generously. So some of you know that uh, I love to get out early in the morning, and this is one of my prayer rituals, uh, a lot of mornings, is I get out and I go searching for beauty in God's creation. It's a way to bring me back to a place of gratitude uh, for the everyday things in my life and the place where God has planted me. And sometimes I do that uh, just listening to what's around me in uh, nature, and other times I come equipped with headphones, uh, with earbuds, and I'm playing something. And one particular day, a couple of weeks ago, I was playing a new album uh, on, on the player, this group called Beautiful Eulogy and a song called If. And the rap lyric of this song was this amazing kind of interruption. <laughs> The best kind of interruption. I'll say it haunted me and continues to haunt me in the best possible way. I don't know if you know what I mean or you can relate to that, but I like when lyrics or when storylines can interrupt my train of thought and take me to a different place in thinking about my relationship with God. And this did that for me. I'm a lyrics guy. I, I love, I listen to music for the sake of the lyrics, okay? Um, so bear with me. Here's the lyric. If in one unfortunate moment you took everything that I own, everything you've given from heaven above, and everything that I've ever known, if you stripped away my ministry, my influence, my reputation, my health, my happiness, my friends, my pride, my expectation, if you caused me to suffer, or to suffer for the cause of the cross, if the cost of my allegiance is prison, and all my freedoms are lost, if you take the breath from my lungs and make an end of my life, if you take the most precious part of me and take my kids and my wife, it would crush me, it would break me, it would suffocate and cause heartache. I would taste the bitter dark providence, but you would still preserve my faith. What's concealed in the heart of having 
is revealed in the losing of things. And I can't even begin to imagine the sting that kind of pain brings. I would never blame you for evil, even if you caused me pain. I came into this world with nothing. And when I die, it'll be just the same. I will praise your name in the giving and taking away. If I have you, I could lose everything and still consider it gain. Absolutely remarkable. Stopped me in my tracks. Took, took my breath away in that moment of the first hearing of that. And brought to mind things like Paul wrote in his, epistle, in his epistles where he talked about, I consider it all gain, you know, in comparison to the all-surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. In that moment of first hearing this, I long very deeply. It's like, I want that. <laughs> I want to feel that kind of unshakable hope in my life. And it struck me that this very gifted lyricist was coming from a place of knowing his rescuer, of knowing God, his good shepherd, in a very deep and profound way. Kind of otherworldly, really. Kind of supernatural. I think he captures the spirit of the contentment that is given to us as we reopen this ancient poem from David. 3,000 years old, and it still breathes words of life into us today. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, that communicates a whole lot in a simple turn of phrase and a simple image. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, in ancient times, that's huge. God, the master of the universe, the Lord, this one we know personally in our lives, he's for us. He's here primarily as one who's caring and providing and guiding. He's giving, which was totally earth-shattering in ancient times. They had other concepts of divine, of some power or force that is behind the inner workings of the universe, but it was around this kind of a formula. The gods are kind of upset and they're really disappointed in the way humanity is going and so you need to make sacrifices that are of increasing significance and extremity in order to keep them at bay and secure stability in your life. In other words, the gods are there to take things from you, not to give them to you. They're in power and you're at their mercy. When we say the Lord is my shepherd, we're professing that the master of the universe cares about us. That my life matters to the master of the universe. De facto. He's chosen to place a value on me. This is an utterly otherworldly way to see the world around us. It's a different kind of kingdom. And furthermore, when we say the Lord is my shepherd, you know, that means he's not a taskmaster or a slave driver. He's not there in order to produce in you this sense of obligation that you must prove your worth in the universe by doing things for God. The Lord is my shepherd. You know what else it means? It means I'm relieved of the burden of being the shepherd of my life, which is huge. I mean, that, that rubs us the wrong way in our American context because we like to believe that we are the master of our own destiny and that we can write our own story however we want. But just consider that. I'm not the shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. You see, we're tempted with the same things that Jesus was tempted with in his lifetime. 
when he went away with Satan into the wilderness, he was tempted in three particular ways that are kind of still the same ways in which Satan tries to get under our skin and kind of lead us astray from God's love and this understanding of God as our good shepherd, the master of the universe, uh, you know, cares deeply about us. It's summarized uh, with these three words uh, from Pete Scazzaro. Performance and popularity and possessions. So around every turn in our lives, we are tempted to say, I am what I do. Performance. I'm only as good as the things that I accomplish or achieve in my life. I'm only as good as the grades that I get or the college that I get accepted into or whatever else perfect world I might imagine for myself. That's a crushing weight. Popularity. I am what others think of me. I am the sum total of the likes that I receive on social media. What a crippling way to view reality. I am what I have, possessions. I'm good as long as I got whatever latest, greatest thing is being pushed as the need now that we lived without generations ago or even one generation ago or even a year ago. But now it's like you got to have it or you're not worth much. I'm not the shepherd. My life matters deeply to the master of the universe in spite of the grades that I get, in spite of how well other people like me, in spite of how much I have. That's an incredibly freeing place to be, and it's not a wonder that the follow-up phrase is this deep sense of security and contentment. I shall not want. It's no longer I am what I do because Christ did it all when it comes to approval from God or worthiness of my life. He declared it's finished. He did all the work for us. Our life matters without us having lifted a finger. I am what others think? No, no, no. I matter to the master of the universe. That audience of one is who I play my life to. I matter no matter what. Possessions. I am what I have? No. I have enough. In fact, when I'm real with myself, I have more than enough. And sometimes, it's in the pursuit of those extra things that are over and above what I actually need, that it's in the chasing after those things, or the hanging on to those things, that I experience the most stress the most trouble and heartache in my life. All is well because God is our good shepherd. I shall not want. See, that carries specific nuances. Ken Bailey says, in a capitalistic society, our entire economic system is built on creating and then satisfying as many perceived wants as possible. The goal appears to be, hey, create wants and turn them into felt needs. The psalmist he has a very basic list, though. He says the shepherd provides these things for his sheep, food and drink and tranquility and rescue when lost and freedom from the fear of evil and death, a sense of being surrounded by the grace of the Lord and a permanent dwelling in the house of the Lord. Amazing. See, we've opted for this uh, translation, which is actually provided by Ken Bailey, the guy I was just quoting, because... It's hoping that we'll kind of experience this psalm in a fresh way. And I find his translation and his commentary to be particularly refreshing and, and appropriate. See, Ken Bailey has uh, recently sainted, gone asleep in, in Jesus, but during his lifetime he spent a lot of time in the Middle East observing culture and learning about the inner workings of shepherding, among other things. And so he speaks out of a sense of experience and observation uh, and first-hand accounts from those things. 
See, the psalmist goes on. He settles me down in green pastures. He settles me down. See, that's an important turn of phrase. He settles me down, not he makes me lie down. See, God doesn't make us any more than a shepherd can make a sheep lie down. You don't force them to the ground and say, be quiet, be still, be peaceful. It's in an environment where needs are met and where threats are kept at bay that the sheep is able to settle down, is able to calm down and relax and be content knowing that the shepherd's there. Settle me, settles me down in green pastures. See, I think we're prone to look at that oftentimes as we imagine green pastures. We go, great dewy meadow of grass everywhere. As far as the eye can see, you just kind of like lay in it like, a, like Scrooge McDuck swimming in a pile of money um, like this, where it's everywhere and you got more than you should ever need in your life all at once. We imagine that we can be like sheep in this uh, wide open land of possibility, uh, America, and that we can be sort of set for life. We position ourselves rightly and, and work hard enough and all this stuff. And so green pastures become for us kind of this, like I'll just kind of lay down and I'll move my head around and I'll get the grass over here and then I'll get the grass over here and then I'll get the grass over here because it's all available right now. <laughs> That's not really the picture that David had in mind. See, David had in mind kind of more like this. Little tufts of greenery, little tufts of sustenance along the way. And as you trust in that shepherd to lead you, you get on to enough for the whole flock and enough for you day by day. And you rely on that shepherd to get you to that next stopover that's going to fill the belly again where you can settle down and you keep moving on and trusting. Daily bread, like manna in the wilderness, right? He leads me beside still waters. See, a shepherd has to plan his day around the availability of water during the heat of the day. Ken Bailey notes, see, sheep are afraid to drink from moving water, so not just any water is going to work. Even if it's shallow, if it's moving, it's going to scare them away. A shepherd, knowing all this, provides still water, whatever the cost. And the good shepherd, he leads. He doesn't drive you. See, this is far from a flattering picture when you get down to it. This shepherd and sheep analogy. But it is a comforting one. It is an emboldening, courage-giving one. Because when I am performing well and when I'm feeling popular and when I feel like I have a lot, then I'm content trying to function as my own shepherd. But when I'm not doing so hot at those things and on my more honest days and my more honest moments, I know that I have the capacity within me to be as dumb, directionless, and defenseless as a sheep. There you go. You got your pastor on record saying that, okay? So bring it up later. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and this is who's leading. Wow, wow watch out. Uh, God's leading. But thanks be to God, we matter because he's our shepherd. He's chosen to look after us and to lead us and to provide everything that's needed and keep us away from threat. See, when the Lord is my shepherd and I trust in God to provide me for the things that I need in my life, I'm content. Internally, I have this otherworldly sense of calm that starts to take over, that starts to work its way into my anxieties and push them out away from me because God gives me everything that I need. What also happens is I'm generous because God gives me everything that I need. In the recognition that I can't take it with me, I might as well share it. In knowing that all the extra stuff sometimes causes the most stress in our lives, the biggest burden in our lives, maybe that 
can lead us to a place of recognizing that maybe somebody else needs it more than I do. And it won't be problematic for me if they're carrying it. See, so as we go through this series, we're going to have opportunities to be generous, ways to be generous through uh, regular proportional gifts, through our offering, uh, and also through uh, gifts at poppalatine.org if you give online, um, ways to advance the kingdom in Palatine and in Lakewood, uh, as well as over and above sacrificial gifts that say, I know that there are people in our community who need things. And so we're collecting things for Thanksgiving baskets and gift cards for homeless high school students and clothing items for PATH. And these are just opportunities, not obligations. Get to, not got to. We're going to keep learning this psalm along the way, and another device for helping to remember it is going to be those bead bracelets that Jenny talked about earlier. Another way to commit the psalm to heart, and so you can pick up a kit, thanks to some special volunteers over at our uh, Connection Center. You can pick those up at the end of the service. Next week, we're going to continue in the recognition that when I wander, God rescues me. Let's close this message time with a word of prayer. This is straight out of Proverbs chapter 30. Two things I ask of you, Lord. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Lord, we thank you that you give us worth and a sense of identity. And knowing that we are your dearly loved sheep, your dearly loved children, and you are our wise and caring and protective shepherd in our lives. Lead us to cling to you in trust, to have confidence, and have hope, because we know you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.